national board. And so for me, uh, bluntly, it is necessary. And uh, there are many reasons for that. First, um, from uh, the background I gave, the issue is that this is a human rights organization that has observed trends, patterns, situations worldwide. And we realized that democracy was under threat. We were getting into a situation that the political scientists have recently uh, decided to call illiberal democracies. You know, and you have governments that are taking over and are suppressing the rights of individuals to be able to express their disagreements, particularly with very important policy options and choices that the state is making, if you like, on our behalf. And so we, we observed those situations throughout the world. There were a number of options. One is that you will go for what we call civil disobedience, where they will make the law and we will justifiably, in the interest of public good, break the law intentionally because we think that that law is inimical to the progress of society. The other one is this protect the protest because we see that there are uh, human rights activists, defenders all over the world that were being victimized for the very things that we all stand for. You know, and so the question is, how do you protect these people? And these people are beginning not to stand alone, but they are standing in groups. And that is where you have many people getting onto the streets, talking about the kind of situations that they disagree with, drawing attention of the state to important questions that require answers, uh, like the examples we saw in the video. And these people come under threat. And the painful thing is that the state security services that we pay to protect us then are unleashed against these people. And I think that when any time I teach human rights and security class, I tell the people in the security services that there is a fundamental misunderstanding of the question of security. What is the reason why we need security? So that people can live in peace, enjoy their rights, and go about their activities. What is the reason we talk about human rights? So that we can have a secure society where everybody feels and enjoys their rights. So in the end, the two coincide, and the two are complementary. So you don't understand why one will come up against the other, thinking that those who talk about human rights, the other time I was telling a group of security officers, okay, you say these human rights people, are you, are you a human being? They say, yes, we are human beings. And I say, so you don't have rights, or you don't want your rights. So you are referring to some people as human rights people. Who are they? Why are they called human rights people? The only reason why they are called human rights people is that they are saying you have a right to be protected, and that's all. So I sincerely agree with it, and I will support it on any day. Thank so you. from where you sit, what can be explored internationally? How can, what leverage in terms of international pressure can those who stage these protests use to ensure that we are protecting the protest? Great, a, a number of them. The number one uh, of it is what we call international solidarity. You see, one thing we need to know, and that's one of the things Amnesty International and other organizations represent, is that any time you stand for the rights, you are not alone. There are many others who are standing with you. And they stand with you not only in your community, not only in your state, but they exist in all other parts of the world. And you see, they exist in different shades. 
Some are called Europeans, some are called Africans, some are called Americans, South Americans, North Americans, Arabs, whatever. But they exist. So if we can come together as a force and identify our networks across the world, and those networks exist, so if you, if you get in touch with an organization like Amnesty International, for example, immediately we have people from other countries, which we call sections, that are activated. And then together, we take action. And you see, there is one thing that the, the most brutal dictator in the world fears and worries about. When he sees that the international community is uniting against me, because uh, the lessons from international relations tells us that we are all overtly aware that you are not alone, you are not an island, and no nation is an island. So the moment pressure is coming from all over the place, and I just want to, uh, get, uh, us to get this one clear. Once pressure is coming from all over the place, they begin to rethink their most wicked thoughts, and then they begin to reframe their ideas about things. Attempting to get some, is it, historical background to the very famous Article 21, particularly Clause 1D. Oliver, how do you explain that provision to us to appreciate that it relates to protests, demonstrations. Um, thank you for this. I, you know, I, one of the things that I enjoy doing uh, is reading. And a couple of, I mean, I think, well, last year, it's almost over a year now, we, my friend and a friend of mine and I decided to share that joy of reading with a, in a communal way. So we organized on Twitter what we call the Twitter reading space. And a lot of the materials we've been reading uh, tend to focus on the history the historical accounts of past politics in this country. Currently now, yesterday we started reading the report of the Watson Commission. Um, the Watson Commission was the commission which was appointed after what well, the British called the 1948 riots or the 1948 disturbances to investigate and, and the, the, the underlying causes of that. One of the things I found very interesting is that in the course of reading you know, a number of people join the space and discuss it. And the, the overwhelming comment that so many people were making was that, well, if you hadn't said 1948, I would have assumed you were talking about present-day Ghana. Or somebody saying that, but what you just said sounds like your own experience that you're talking about. And it's very, it's very interesting to look at it. So the Commissioner of Police then, Ballantyne, invites Tamaklu. Tamaklu was the ex-service. Uh, so we have the ex-servicemen union. And he was the chair of the union. So they're planning on this protest about, you know, conditions after the war. And so they invite him. They were supposed to present the petition to the Christian Moore Castle. And he says to him that a couple of days before the protest, um, it was supposed to be on 24th February. It happened on 28th, the Saturday. And he says, but you know that this protest you guys have planned, it's illegal because the authorities have not approved this protest. <laughs> but as a way out, I can give you we can reach a compromise. The compromise is that I would point on the map a different route for you and your people would agree and then when you get there to the secretariat, a few of you will come out and we will come and receive the petition on behalf of the, uh, of the governor. Now, when you're reading the report, at some point you're unclear as to whether the, the report says that Tamaklu agreed to this arrangement, but they were unsure whether or not it was an agreement only so that they can go ahead with it or in fact, the later on the route deviated from what was planned and how they, they go about the protest. Now, the, the interesting thing I found about the, the conversation that happened between the Commission of Police and Tamaklu, is exactly the kind of conversations that we have been in so many times whenever the question of protest has come up. Now, the language of what Tamaklu was dealing with was to get a permit at the time has changed. Here we say that we only notify and give the police notice of what the protest is. But in fact, in the reasoning and how we have, we have made it work, it almost reminds you of the colonial relic of every time you need the police say so before you're going ahead to do that. It is this idea 
that when you read in the Watson Commission report, that certain individuals who then, after the protests, were arrested, is where we get the myth of the Big Six from. That historically, our independence owes to a certain number of individuals who were arrested because of a protest. Now, if you take every single currency in this country, now we phased out the two CD notes, but every single currency bears the faces of the Big Six which for me is an indication that there's a national or historical sense in which we as a society view protests as part of what it is our national identity. And for me, it becomes important that when you're reading uh, the video made reference to MPP versus uh, uh, IGP, when the conversation about should we consider and continue this practice of seeking permits as part of this democratic journey, that the, they were very clear and emphatic that it is absolutely undermining the right to protest, to continue to insist that the person's right to protest must get the sign off of another, another person. That was the idea and history, a sense of history that you are reading in terms of what you are bringing to bear on this. But it wasn't always so in terms of how we have viewed protests historically in this country. Even in the aftermath of, of those who won independence on the back of protest, did not put together a legal framework that was protective of protest. We had to wait until Nkrumah was overthrown, and in the 69 provisions, that the real discussion about the place of speech and the place of protest in securing our democracy, that's at a sense of which we have to be able to put that in place, starts, starts to develop. Unfortunately, the 69 constitution lived a very short life. And so, from, from 71 all the way to 79, we had a whole period of history where you couldn't make reference to any pre-existing right of protest. It didn't mean that protests did not happen. That we know that the, the FGM and other movements continued to, to organize protests. For instance, the a big protest was the opposing Achambon's UNIGOV proposal. That historically, it has always been a push and pull between how those who are governed relate and speak to those who govern. And the framework of protest has always been the, the framework within which we mediate that. So that when we come to 92, our perspective of protest and its place in our history, we must have that in mind. Or else it becomes worse on paper. And worse on paper do not mean anything to us unless we can see its continuous manifestation and continuous reinforcement that it is part of us as we a people. I'll give a short example and then I'll hand over to you. Um, one of the things that I hear Ghanaians talk a lot about, uh, particularly when we step out, is this sense of pride that we're the first country, sub-Saharan African country, to gain independence. And it's almost, we must agree, some sense of a part of a national identity. That in terms of how we hold our government accountable in terms of foreign, foreign policies, I remember when Atameos was came up with the Diu Fiasem, there was a strong backlash against it about why we are not intervening in Cote d'Ivoire, because we've always viewed ourselves as some sorts of beacon. It directs the people's thinking about what's important in, place, in, in the place and the way they interact. Protests must have the same meaning for us as a people. That if persons, persons were protesting in any part of the country and that protest was suppressed, everybody would look to Ghana and say that Ghana will speak up because they have made protest itself a key part of their national identity. That is what I think the Constitution is seeking to protect. And that is why when you come to the Constitution, the part about the human rights, I always say that even though we have a chapter on human rights, the part around these protests and certain freedoms, we go on in a Article 21 and call them fundamental freedoms. They are fundamental because they ought to be fundamental to our way of life. That's how I see it. Thank you. Because of the way you have commenced this I, I like uh, Dr. Mami Mensaboso to come in in respect of what you see the legal framework to be, whether or not it is useful, it is too limiting, and what yeah. should be done about it, if any at all. Because from the 1972 decree, which required a permit, and to the one now 1994, which says, give a notice. Are there really any difference? Um, thank you, Samson. Um, it's a pleasure to be here talking about the parts of our constitution that we must keep alive. Um, I'm going to start by talking about where 
we talk about the right to protest, but if you look in our constitution, you'll never see the words right to protest. So I thought a good place to start is to help you understand where that right comes from. So what do we do when we protest? We express an opinion. We have the right to express our opinion in our freedom of speech. We have the right to form that opinion as part of our freedom of conscience. And when we have formed the opinion and we have spoken it, we have a right to speak to other people who think that way. That's our freedom of association. And when we have associated together and we've decided we want to go and talk about it somewhere, we have the right to move to do so. And that is our freedom of movement. If you think about it, the right to protest is a very composite right. And it is, if you like, the manifestation of a multiple of our rights, of our experience as citizens, of the, of the power to walk through the country and say, you know, I don't like red. Even to say, I don't like red, you have to have the power to have the opinion about red. And you have the power to find other people who don't like red. And so when we think of the right to protest, it's not simply about shouting and making noise. It is really, it is the, the totality of our freedoms as a citizen. If you don't have the right to protest, you don't have the right to anything else. And so it's a, it's a really important thing for us to sit down and think about what's happening to that right. Because different aspects of that right get attacked by different actions. Now, one of my favorite forms of living protest that we don't really think of as a protest is the Ghana Bar Association's annual Lest We Forget ceremony in which we remember the three martyrs. We don't go and shout. We don't collect in the streets. But the fact that we have refused to let the memory of what they died for go away is itself a protest against what they died for. And so there are very many ways in which we protect that right to protest. And I think being conscious of it and conscious of the little parts of it so that when someone attacks your right to, to think about something, you realize that it's going to snowball into a bigger resistance. And it is going to eventually create a bunch of people who form a straight line and think in a certain way because somebody said that's what's allowed. So um, I think that's the legal framework for protesting is really extensive at the constitutional level. To answer your question directly about whether um, needing a permit and needing notice are different, I think they are substantially different. If you need a permit, yesterday I was, I was teaching the difference between privilege and claim right to a jurisprudence class yesterday. And I was saying, you know, if someone can change your relationship to something, however much they let you think you are in charge, you're not. You're just lucky. So if you, have, you require a permit, then you're lucky when you get it. The person who has the power to give you the permit is actually the one with the right to decide whether there should be a protest. If you have to give someone notice, you're letting them know. You get to decide if you'll protest. You just have to let them know that you'll protest. And I think any good relationship requires communication. When you fight with your partner, they ought to know you're upset. It shouldn't be some secret you keep in your heart and it festers and they ought to know you are upset. But that's notice. And that's all that's supposed to be. I think part of why it has worked the way it has worked is because we ourselves haven't understood the difference between permit and, and notice. Because if I have the right to do something and tell you about it and you don't like it, eh? don't like it. Eh? But if I don't understand that when you don't like it, it doesn't then require me to say, oh, okay, it's okay then without your having the power, I have ceded it. And so the, we need to make that... Supreme Court can say whatever they like, you know. They can give us all the power on the planet. Until we take it, it doesn't matter. It's what Oliver is saying about um, words. And um, Madison puts it beautifully. Parchment soldiers, he calls them. Parchment soldiers. They'll do nothing for you. So at some point, we are going to have to know that we, our legal framework doesn't require us to wait for the police to give us a permit. And I think that you see that trend growing a bit more. I remember writing a blog piece um, for the Oxford Human Rights Hub in 2014 um, and talking about, um, and it was titled, um, With Painful Steps and Slow, Making Rights Tangible with Painful Steps and Slow. And you have to understand that any rights journey is going to be painful, and it is going to be slow. And, and so to, to reiterate what Vincent said, the fact that it's painful or slow 
should not be what we focus on. It has to happen. Um, and when you're making change, you don't make it overnight. So the legal framework itself, I would say, is not insufficient. It is the perhaps social framework, the fear of getting attacked, the fear of being embarrassed, the fear that your daughter will be seen on the streets and that if the police push her, then hey, this is on camera with the police, some strange policeman touching her thighs. Those kinds of pressures, far more so than our legal framework, are what affect our right to protest. So the provisions in the Constitution, particularly Article 21, and you have woven them so beautifully in a manner I think the framers didn't think about. From conscience to thought to assembly and, and movement, the way you put it. Together, reading that together with the Public Order Act. Once again, we are back there. Do they protect the protest or what has to be done? Again, I think the Public Order Act has, it's the, the thing with the Public Order Act is, I can't say it's entirely unnecessary. For the reason that, because protest is often an outpouring of emotion, it also is a potential space for commotion. Not necessarily violence, just commotion. And so the idea that the police forces, the security forces, should know that there's a possibility that there'll be a large number of people in a place, a coordination challenge. Whenever 80 people need to move out of a door, somebody needs to direct it. And so its existence itself is not, I think, contrary to the constitutional idea. Its methodology and perhaps it is the fact that it is coming into the hands of an institution that has a traditional culture of misunderstanding its role. Hmm. The police service, I think if it's one of the, one of the institutions that most thoroughly needs um, and, I, and I, has an identity crisis and most thoroughly needs to rethink what it is, is the police service. Because it began as a colonial tool. And as a colonial tool, it was the governor's um, instrument for suppression. And as with many things that we inherited when we became independent, we did not dismantle the, the, the psychology of the institution. Um, and every government, unfortunately, has found it useful to have an institution that, expect, that treats itself as an arm to respond to their government's um, desires. The police service doesn't necessarily mean harm. But habit is a, is a, is a powerful thing. And when you habitually respond in a certain way, it comes to be how you respond, which is why I say it needs an actual psychological um, engagement with what the 1992 constitution makes it. Different from what Gordon Gudgesberg required it to be. And, and I think part of that is the problem, that their job when there's a protest is to coordinate it. Traffic still has to, 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 to move on. People, other people not protesting need to get about their lives. Would, we don't want a situation where, because we're having a protest, doctors can't get to the hospital and people die because we wanted to protest something else, right? We wanted to protest so that they would get to live. And, then, and so there's definitely a need for coordination whenever there's a protest. Mm. But coordination, not control. Right. Yeah, so I return to you, Dr. Mensabonsu, and please hold on for me. Um, knowing that the police have regularly abuse the provisions of the Public Order Act, particularly in respect <clears throat> of having served them the notice far in advance. Then they return to you just about 48 hours to the protest, and they make a demand. Before you get back to them, they have gone to court, and they used to go to the lower court. Yeah. And they used to go ex party on the blind side of the protesters until Justice uh, Dennis Ajay um, in 2015 struck that down and said, you can't go to court without notifying the protesters. And you should not also go to a lower court. You must go to the high court. Even in the midst of that, we still see an abuse. How can the judiciary, the court, protect the protest? Um, I think the, in, in criminal law, the posture of 
of that body of law, the posture is generally that the state is stronger and therefore the accused should have the greater weight of the law protecting them. And so in criminal law, we tend to err on the side of the accused. Mm -hmm. I think if the judiciary were to adopt the attitude of erring on the side of the protesters, that it would be a little bit more helpful towards how the Public Order Act um, is implemented. Um, I agree with Oliver about bundling together these items that suggest that protest, firearms, and emergencies yeah. go together. Yeah. They, they ought to be separate acts. The things that the idea of somewhat regulating a protest itself is what I'm okay with. It's the, but he's quite right that the psychology of the old days kind of shows through the act. You have, we have, we would, I would say we have to have some sort of public order um, control coordination reasons. But the judiciary should be suspicious of an institution that has power, that has come against a collection of citizens. Whatever the reason they have come, the judiciary's attitude should be, you need to prove that these people actually are a problem. And, and um, like Oliver says, there's a sort of automatic uh, deference to the security forces. And it's a problem that a lot of countries have, that the judges always feel a little nervous about the security things because they don't know and if they are wrong and then so I suppose they also must be willing to take mm. the responsibility for having been wrong on the side of the citizens but that I think would be very helpful if the the police came to the court and said they wanted to stop a protest and the court asked why what's and, wrong with this they route would, they would often say that we have certain activities on that same day that we will not have enough men in recent times we have heard them say Within the sub-region somewhere, there is this terrorism stuff. So please, we are not too sure. What, sh what can a court do? Terrorism has been one of the tools that everywhere in the world has been used to erode rights. Everywhere in the world. As soon as you throw the word terrorism out, it's almost like you are uh, untouchable in the, in the wisdom of your, your position. It is true. Terrorism is a big problem across the world. And in our sub-region, because of our porous borders, terrorism is not something we should joke with. Nevertheless, we can't live every moment of our lives um, controlled by the fear of terrorism. In which case, we might as well just throw out our constitution and just be gathering around the next terrorist um, possibility and then do whatever we think is, is necessary. The whole point in, in... I always say that rights are never put in a constitution for the benefit of the majority. Majorities don't need rights. Majorities are very good at protecting themselves. Rights are inherently a thing for the minority, for the weaker person. It is a, it is a commitment that when we are afraid, we will still remember not to do this. So if the police say there's terrorist something in the sub-region and they are not too sure, we should trust that we have trained our police service well. And they have also divided themselves into units. I'm quite certain it's not MTTU that's going to respond to terrorist response uh, attacks. I don't know much about how the police works, but I think it's not going to be MTTU. That'll be the first point of call for terrorist acts. Therefore, to say that you're not sure about enough men and all of that, it just seems to me a very tidy and easy way out. And perhaps we as a people may be willing to take the risk that MTTU will be too busy to respond to the terrorist act um, because they were busy protecting us as we protest. And that should be okay too. Judges should be willing to take the chance that we are all wrong. The protesters, the police, we are all wrong and it was going to be an emergency and we are going to regret it. But history is made up of moments where we took the chance and then we were right. Okay. Thank you very much. And now, Bridget, the Constitution in Article 12 says that the fundamental human rights and freedoms enshrined in this chapter shall be respected and upheld by the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, and all other organs of government and its agencies, and where applicable to them by all natural and legal persons. This comes right in the chapter where you have that right to demonstration from where you sit do you feel this is going on thank you very much um, 
I want to start off by saying that even as journalists, we're told that we are the fourth estate of the realm. That's right. And we're supposed to hold these accountable, pay their actions, their responsibilities. And yet, we are also trained to be neutral. And journalists are so, we are so obsessed with the idea of being neutral that we are afraid to take a stand. How can you be neutral in moments of oppression? Yesterday, a 15-year-old boy, girl, was killed at Karaga Palace by military. Do I need to get the military side to state that it was wrong for them to go there, to invade the palace and kill a 15-year-old boy because there's a chieftaincy issue? Why were they there in the first place? So if we don't have an understanding of what it is that we are supposed to do, then we become victims of these. Also, I don't think that we are allowed, even in training, to get these. A lot of the things that I know about what a journalist is to do, I learned it on the job. Mm. It is not part of our school's training. Even to write, you do it on the job. So when, once we are in the profession, then we begin to learn. And that's why I'm always excited to sit next to um, Barker because I get to learn a lot. And, but without information, without reading and without understanding what it is that we are to do, or what it is that is expected of these, whether it's the executive, the legislature, we cannot hold them accountable. Because each one of them is happy to protect its own. No one will give you that. I mean, um, I'm happy for institutions like Fact Check Ghana because what we have become are institutions of um, announcements. We're not doing journal, it's just an institution of announcements. A vice president says we've created 2.1 million jobs and you can't say it's a lie, you just have to report it. And then another institution would come and say it is a lie, even though you can, because there's this fear of replications. One to the organization, where you work, you don't want to ruffle any feathers, you want, um, in quotes, you know, favors, because you want access to be able to talk to these same persons. But you really don't need that. But it's there. And unfortunately, we seem to have accepted it. And so it keeps happening and happening without us even realizing that we are being abused. Our rights are being trampled upon. That We literally have, ac we should have access to these and do our work. So um, it, it's, it's, it, there's a, it's a, we are a long way from this, that it, may, it exists here, but look, if the president is traveling, we don't have the resources to. So they have to pick persons they think would report favorably for them. It happens in same in parliament, <laughs> the speakers represent it. You have to be somebody they think would report favorably else you're not going to have access. We just saw the All African Games. And there's a certain, and I absolutely admire sports journalists. There's a certain obsession. They say they like reporting negative stories too much. When the South African team left Ghana, it wasn't us. They said our pitches were substandard. It would injure their players, and so they left. So the sports journalists are like, oh, we did not create that. So how is this negative how, how how is this our creation because there's this obsession with tell a good story but what is there to tell if, if it's just the negative story to tell i don't think anybody and, goes and the out games, there the games are over and it appears as if self-censored somewhat all the sports journalists are talking about how great a game it was, was. and how we did well in yes. organizing it. Yes. They have suddenly censored themselves from talking about the problems that they discovered earlier for which they were criticized by the organizing committee. Yes. So for instance, you know, before the tournament started, there was this is it eighteen million dollars that was used to renovate Legon to have people um, just stay there for a few weeks. And it's such a crazy amount to begin with, to renovate. It wasn't like they built a new structures, bringing in a few air conditioners, oh, let's get more beds here. But 
who are you to who are, how dare you question authority but that is the more reason why we must because like um, prof said who left said that when you keep quiet because of the replications then literally they have won i i was in a school that i was the most hated person in that school and yet today i'm the most used example in that school like all the you have to be like bridges but we had to fight for that to happen because we challenged the authority they had the power so say my school the headmistress was the executive and let's say we, we were we represented the students and then the teachers were would be uh, our so executive the legislature and the school was not performing well and the report the the impression is that oh it must be the students and so when we were elected as student representatives we had to investigate and we in our document it turns out it's actually the teacher's fault because one a teacher used the entire time chasing school fees that they use two weeks to teach a syllabus that is supposed to be covered in 16 weeks and when we put that document together and presented it to our executive which is our headmistress she was so angry she called for a meeting with the the uh, prefects and i was a senior girl's person we had a senior boys prefect <laughs> And so it was to, to intimidate us. So we get to the room, our boys prefect gets up, and he stands and says, you know they are coming here to intimidate us. You know they are coming here to, let's stand together, stand by what we wrote. So headmistress comes up, does what she has to do, said, you know, the tone, how dare we, we just want to perform better. So our boys prefect, who was gingering us, gets up, and that was the first time I heard this, and so I hated this expression so much. He got up, and the first thing he says was, foolishness is found around the heart of a child, and only the word of God. I was like, Thomas, please sit down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because he was thinking about his future. I mean, just think about this. This is so, this my school is Ghana, and the headmistress is our president, and they held our future in their hands, and we were representing the people. So the teachers are there as part of the executive or the legislature. So they had power over us. So I, I could understand why he had to say that. But I, I, I said, please sit down. So I get up and says, we should say exactly what we had written. So I had to, I mean, imagine 2001, look at my teacher and say, okay, Miss Kujo, when you come to class, you talk down on our parents. You call my mother a thief. My mom is not a thief. You've never known her. So psychologically, I am not in that frame to listen. Mr. Kujo, you ran on, so we, we had to. When I did that, I think everybody else felt that we could do this. And so we did. And together, you know, we saw the teachers slum in their seats, slouch some, just bow their heads in shame. And they said, thank you. And they left. We became the number one enemies. I had a portrait on the school wall. They took it down, you know, <laughs> because we, we had enacted something. Right. And yet they changed, and the story of the school changed, and our results were better. The headmistress never spoke to me till she died. And, um, but today they say, oh, you have to be like Bridges. But that story was not a positive story. So mm. that's how state powers, um, you know, state uses its power. So the provision against, I referenced. Yeah. The framers of the constitution said the executive the judiciary the legislature and all other persons and institutions within the realm mm. are supposed to uphold as it were protect yeah the protest yeah is that what you feel no at all absolutely not if if they were why would they be chasing us for simply going out there's need there's need to be order in that society so if something is a bit disorderly, the state has a right for the, for the good of the greater majority, so to speak. Who decides the good of the greater majority? Because you voted them to do so. <laughs> yes, that's why I love what uh, Prof, uh, Prof said, that it is there to protect everybody, not just some, and especially those who don't have a voice. So women, children, persons in the minority. And unfortunately, it is rather the opposite. The people who have the power rather see it as an opportunity to oppress those who do not have. And that is what we're seeing. I suppose it's been as enriching as it has been empowering. Uh, thank you to you, Oliver Baker, Vomawa, human rights activist and lawyer, Merton and Everett. Professor Mame, 
A.S. Mensa Bunsu, Associate Professor of Law and Head Humanities and Social Sciences at Ashesi University, Professor Vincent Azahili Mensa, former board chair of Amnesty International, and Ms. Bridget Otu, journalist, Metro Television. Thank you all so very much.